Hey friends, before we jump into the episode this week, we wanted to spend just a quick moment talking about the upcoming Father's Day as this episode releases. For all of you who are out there who are fathers, we appreciate you. There is few higher callings than it is to be a father, and we want to challenge you to be doing that the best that you can. For those of you who are not fathers yet and are considering that honor, we challenge you to take it seriously and to put it in your heart as something that is perhaps more meaningful than hardly any other task that you will accomplish in your life. As a father myself, I find great honor in raising the next generation. And I just want to encourage you, for those of you who are feeling beat down or, or tired, to keep going, to challenge you, for those of you who are considering what else you have to do and, and uh, where else you can go, and to just say, from my heart to yours, happy Father's Day. Right on, buddy. I am someone who did not grow up with a father, didn't meet my stepfather until I think I was 16. Good dude. Great to my mom um, and a great guy for my for my sister. But I was, you know, well into my teen years uh, before I met him. And so grew up without a father and feel, you know, felt growing up the um, need for for a strong male father figure in my life and I now aim to be that for my kids and I and I, you know, I read something stupid on online the other day that uh had me feeling kind of mushy not my not my typical mo right Nate uh, <laughs> right, right but you know it, it whatever I read made me realize that I had I have four kids so my wife and I have four kids a 17 year old daughter a 14 year old son and then we have two very young daughters that are seven and four we can't have kids anymore, or I can't at least, so that's behind us. But it made me realize that at some point I had held my two oldest kids the very last time. And I don't know when that happened. I'll never find out what that time, when that day was. But at some point I held them for the last time. And uh, now if I tried to hold them, they'd be creeped out, rightfully so, and uh, maybe take a swing at me. Um, but it, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to come to that realization while I still have a seven and a four year old to, you know, leave here right after we get done with this and go love on a little bit and, and cherish. Um, but I, I behoove you to leave nothing when it comes to pouring out just your love and affection on those kids, you fathers, especially with younger kids, just, just let it go. Don't be shy about it. Um, you know, I didn't walk around feeling the need for a father when I was a kid, but from time to time I would see, um, you know, other kids getting affection from a father and, and that would make me think that that would, that's when I felt like I was missing something that, and when I, you know, could use some protection in Detroit, those were the two, two times that I felt like I was really missing something. So take, take this weekend coming up as this airs at least uh father's day is this coming Sunday and um, you know, lo- love on your father, if you had one in your life and he's still around and, and you get that opportunity. And if not, um, you know, be the best father you can be. And if you're neither, if you got neither of those things, then, you know, honor somebody who's doing it well, reach out around you and just, just give somebody kudos for what they're doing or maybe step in for a, couple minutes to be a father figure to someone else if, if you know somebody who's young without a father don't care what they act like they need that father figure so so if you if you can do that props to you that's so right on brian and uh we're about to have a great conversation with somebody who is an excellent father himself now onto the show we are the only squadron in the marine corps that has the unique opportunities to select the people that are coming in the folder of applicants sits in a room that we all have access to. We all write notes and we write, Hey, I deployed with this guy and, and man, he just really was a team player. And the commanding officer reads those comments and he is the final say of who comes in. And he, he agrees. And he says, yep, this guy's good for our, good for our unit. He's good for the, the mission that we are, are doing. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, 
Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your host, Nate and Brian, are hanging out with you one more time, and we are excited to bring a new guest onto the show today. His name is Lieutenant Colonel John Ballinger, and he is a former Marine One helicopter pilot. We're excited to invite him on the show, and we are going to have a great conversation with him today. But before we do, we're going to break down some of the concepts we'll be discussing in today's show before we get into the interview, and we're going to turn to Brian for our quote. There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Ernest Hemingway. Oh, the great poet. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That dude. Yeah. Um, It's a very Waste No uh, Day-esque quote. I like it. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, it was tough to come up with with a quote for for, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel's episode. Because it's like we're not talking about a concept really relative to technicians. But the one thing that I I don't even know if you know, I spent two hours, I think two hours on the phone with him um, before before we did the episode. Oh, yeah. And and John, anything left? John's coming in uh, in person to do the episode, which is even more awesome. Uh, Driving from where's he driving from? DC. DC. Yeah, Yeah. So. Hour and a half drive to come and hang out with us in the room here. Of course, he's driving from DC. Hello. Yeah, true. Maybe he's flying from DC. Hey, I don't know who ooh, he's going to land a helicopter. Is that like one of the like a company perk that you, <laughs> you can just take one out for the weekend? <laughs> yeah, as Nate pointed out, the Marine One, for those who don't know, is the present is the hel- helicopter that carries the president. So specifically, the call sign of the helicopter that the correct. president is aboard. Yeah. So really, any helicopter that. Uh, president jumps on it becomes marine one and john flew one of the helicopters that would carry said president yes in fact uh two presidents he served during uh president trump and president biden's terms that's correct so we are we're looking forward to diving into that whole but yeah as i as i chatted with him like he's a he's a super accomplished guy right he's done a lot and the one thing that kept you know echoing back to me is how he has a way of making me feel like I'm more accomplished than he is while we talk like just true humility you know Mm. um and I'm like he doesn't uh I don't it's almost like he doesn't feel like he's accomplished that much like (laughs) he showed up and it all happened but he is yeah he's he's done a lot and I believe from talking to him for so long he has a lot more to do as well hmm Yes, and uh, what's exciting about him is that he is actually at the end of his military career, and so we're going to spend some time uh, talking about something that he's jumping into called SkillBridge, uh, which is a program for exiting military personnel to basically transition into the private world uh, in various ways, including the trades, uh, as well as many other options. But that's a, a cool and unique program that he is actually taking part in as a former uh, military personnel person. Yep. And our, uh, our buddy and friend of the show, Andrew Dobbins had a little shout out for him. He said, uh, HMX one baby represent Semper Fi. <laughs> uh, those Marine guys, they don't let it uh, rest. That's great. Yeah. And he's going to talk, uh, John's going to talk a little bit about uh, service and HVAC service tech. He's dealt with named Robert Siegler who um, personally blew his mind with an insanely high level of customer service to the point that they will now wait uh, for service when Robert is available. Oh, that sounds good. We'll have to talk about that for sure. Shout out to Robert for giving some great service. And while we're on the subject of great customer service, Benjamin Franklin Plumbing, Michael Green, who is the Vice President of Operations for Benjamin Franklin Plumbing Corporate, uh, was chatting with me about the fact that Benjamin Franklin Plumbing is involved in SkillBridge. And he said, our partnership with Recruit Military, 
via Skillbridge holds tremendous promise as a transition pathway back to civilian life and work. Research has found that working in a franchise system is a great fit for veterans as techs or as owners. At Benjamin Franklin Plumbing, it's our proven systems of success that enable our techs and owners to be all that they can be. That's the isn't that the army motto? Yeah, not not the current one either. I did make fun of them on the next text, as you can see. I said, it's the army of one now, buddy. <laughs> uh, and he said, big salute to the pilot and thank you for your service to uh, oh, very cool. John Ballinger. Yeah, so I would be interested to discuss with John today uh, the ideas of parallelism between what he's been doing and what we do in the trades. And that may seem to some to be like a completely different idea. And of course, you know, I don't know that many of the people that listening to this podcast uh, are hopping in a helicopter with the president sitting behind them. Uh, But it will be interesting to talk with him about all the things that he has done to advance himself in the career, uh, to get himself in a position that was ready to accept those challenges, to be promoted into those places and to handle the responsibilities that came with it and how that ties into what we do in the trades, because I believe there's a lot there for us to mine and to understand uh, the values of what he was doing and how they can apply to our own lives today. But for right now, it is time to put John Ballinger in your passenger seat. Our guest today is Lieutenant Colonel John Ballinger. He hails from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and is a 2002 graduate of Oral Roberts University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business, Marketing, and a minor in Management. He was a candidate in the OCC program of 2002 and was commissioned 10 weeks after as a second lieutenant. Following his commission, he completed the basic school and once complete with USN Flight School, was designated a Naval Aviator in March of 2005. Following survival, evasion, resistance, and escape school, First Lieutenant Ballinger completed initial CH-53E training with HMT-302s in the three months and reported to the heavy haulers of HMH-462 at MCAS Miramar in San Diego, California in August of 2005. He has deployed and served and lived in many other locations, including Okinawa, Japan. He was with the Tigers in Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom as the airframes officer, he's been in Quantico, Virginia. He's been in Kanohe Bay. Well, I probably mispronounced that. Kanohe Bay, Hawaii. And upon his return from Afghanistan, Major Ballinger at that time left Hawaii for Quantico, Virginia, and an assignment with the Marine Helicopter Squadron One, otherwise known as HMX One. While training to fly the VH threes and VH sixties, he was the S five assistant officer and the assistant presidential support facilities officer. He was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in August of 19 and took over as the Presidential Support Facilities Officer in charge. His personal awards include the NATO Commendation Medal, the Air Medal with Strike Flight Numeral 4, Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medals, and Navy Achievement Medal. Major Ballinger married the love of his life, the former Miss Rianne Lee, and they have two children, Lincoln and Hudson, and most recently... Uh, he is pursuing SkillBridge, which is something we are going to be talking about today. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We'll do the SkillBridge thing, all right? But we want mostly <laughs> stories from Marine helicopters and Marine One. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we always like to start uh, the episode by hearing about our guest and kind of hearing about their background and everything. So. I'm not sure where to start with you because I'm sure. Let's start with gratitude for him. <laughs> driving from DC. That's true. To, to be in uh, studio in studio for this podcast. When you live, how how many hours away it, it was? It was two hours. It drive? was well worth the drive. Yeah. Two hours. So far, so good. Yeah. So awesome. Far. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to have you. We always like having somebody in with us as opposed to being over the phone. Uh, but yeah, we'd like to hear how you uh, how you got to where you are now. And uh, why don't we start off? What are, what are you currently doing? Well, currently, I uh, just had my retirement ceremony last Thursday. Oh, congratulations. Um, so I'm a new unofficial retiree of the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, my actual retirement date is 1 October. That's when I'll be a civilian. That's and, October uh, 1st, Brian, just making sure. Oh, okay. That's, I was Googling it. <laughs> yep. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm currently enrolled in the SkillBridge program. Okay. And uh, a local company, Eberly Myers, is uh, which you guys are very familiar with. They're yeah. New, I'm linked up with them. Um, 
just to get some experience in the commercial real estate development world, which is a far cry from being a Marine Corps helicopter pilot. So they've taken me under their wing, um, and I'm, I'm, I've got about six months where I can really just try to glean some information from them and figure out where I fit into uh, their process and their uh, system, and then see if I can make it on my own after that. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic. And this is a Department of Defense program, correct? It is. So DOD came up with the SkillBridge program uh, probably three or four years ago. And it allows service members who get the approval from their chain of command to go team up with a company. could be nationwide. It could be a local company. And they get to partner with them from anywhere from a couple weeks up to six months. Um, And they come in and they work for that company. No cost to the company. The company gets to see how that service member works outside of the military. The service member gets to see how he performs outside of the military. Um, and he continues to receive a paycheck from the military until uh, he exits from the service. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure we will jump more into that uh, as we dig into the program here. But I'm certainly interested. Absolutely. What about the history, man? Where, where do you hail from? So originally I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, born and raised there. Went to a small Christian school in Tulsa uh, all the way up to 12th grade. And then I transitioned to Oral Roberts uh, University, not a dental school. <laughs> uh, get that question a lot. Right. The name is Oral. <laughs> yep. Yes. That was his name. Yes. Um, was a, uh, got my degree in marketing and business management. Okay. And, uh, you know, junior year was thinking I had the whole plan laid out in front of me, staying in my hometown, had a job, you know, set up. And the more I thought about it, I just got very uncomfortable with having a plan completely laid out, a plan that I would just fall into very casually. I loved to travel. I had some aviation in my background through family members, and I started thinking hardcore about what the next step looked like. And, and it, the more I looked at it, the more it felt very uh, unnatural to do something like going into the service, but there was that excitement, right? Of the unknown. And, uh, I, you know, went to a recruiter and he referred me to the officer selection office, um, in my state. And I went and talked to him and said, Hey, I would love to see what this thing is all about. See what this, you know, what service looks like for me. He was a Marine recruiter and, uh, asked me to take a, a military test Uh, specifically designed for pilots if you wanted to go into aviation. And uh, I took it, failed it, took it again, failed it, took it a third time, passed. (laughs) And uh, Did you just ace it that time? Like you knew all the wrong answers? You'd think think I I would, but (laughs) I I think I walked out with the skin of my teeth. Um, Two months or, or, or so, that was my junior year. I went into my senior year thinking, okay, I I can do this Marine Corps thing um, or I can graduate and do this more. Um, okay. So you hadn't enlisted at all at that point. Correct. Okay. Correct. Just considering your options. Considering options. Um, and then senior year came and it just felt like this was something that was something I should do. Um, maybe it was spurred on by my dad. You know, I came home one day and I had a bunch of pamphlets sitting on the dinner table <laughs> and he looked over my shoulder and he said, what's that? I said, ah, dad, I think I want to join the Marine Corps. He goes, yeah, right. (laughs) Because he knew me, right? He knew the son that he had raised and he knew how I had bucked uh, all tradition and I had bucked rules. You know, at the time I was going to Christian school um, or Roberts and we had a uniform. I was getting fined for not shaving. I was getting fined for being out of dress code. I was fined for having girls in my dorm. I was fined for... You know, sounds like a lot of our technicians here. Actually, (laughs) So, so you have that, you know, that history of deviance and then you tell your dad that you can join the Marine Corps and he, yeah, right. Sure. Um, that actual conversation with him really sparked something in me. And I thought, man, if my dad doesn't think I can do this, maybe he's really right or maybe he's really wrong. But the only way I can figure that out is if I try. 
And so I joined right after graduation. I graduated in um, April, June uh, 2nd, 2002. Uh, I was being delivered to Quantico, uh, Virginia for officer uh, candidate school. That fast, huh? Yep. Two months. Wow. Enjoy, you know, enjoy the transition. And, um, you know, it's a 10 week course, but I, I graduated as a second lieutenant. Um, fast track. I went to, you know, the basic school, which is something unique to the Marine Corps, uh, where they send all the Marines to learn how to be a basic um, infantry officer uh, before you go do your trade, before you go to become a pilot or a tank driver or a lawyer. Um, and then went right to flight school. And uh, here I am 20 years later, walking out the door. Um, and it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, that, that is incredible. How long did it take you to get from basic to behind the, behind the, what do you call them? Sticks? Yep. <laughs> right. Depends Look on what you, you fly. Made. Yeah. Did a lot of, uh, Wikipedia this weekend. <laughs> <huh? laughs> so, um, real quick snapshot, uh, officer candidate school is 10 weeks. The basic school for all Marines to go through is six months and then, Flight school, um, you go through a 10-week course. It's called API. It's just your basic introductory to um, navigation and weather and aerodynamics, things like that, and, and go through the dunk, the dunker. Um, What's that? So it's it's kind of the worst part of this whole deal is is they load you up in, in various apparatuses that start above water, end underwater, upside down, and you're trying to find out how to get out of them. Uh. Um, <laughs> either with or without a breathing apparatus. So it's, you know, a lot of guys fear it. You have to do it every four years. So it's a repeatable oh, training man. exercise. The entire time you're in the Marines. Entire time. Yeah. Well, specifically in, in, uh, in aviation. 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 Yes. So, yeah. yeah. So there are differences between helos and, and jets, um, on, you know, in the jet dunker, you're tied to a parachute. What is, what is this helo nonsense? Look, I watched <laughs> Terminator and I know you call them choppers in, in the military and law enforcement, right? Um, so yeah, API is, is 10 weeks of just rudimentary aviation knowledge. And then once you finish that, you go to what really all Navy Marines and Coast Guard pilots go through is we all kind of go through the same flight training. Whereas Air Force guys go through their own training and the Army does their own. Top Gun. Um, yeah. Not not as, I mean, there was, there was a lot of volleyball. Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, hanging with the boys. <laughs> Did you have the time of your life, though? Oh, it was so good. Um, I can see you in the cutoff jean shorts uh, in, in no shirt. I mean, I have the sure. jacket's in the car. If you, if you really want to go grab it. Um, so what do you, what are all you certified to fly? I mean, like how, how far does that go? So, so for again, Navy Marines and Coast Guard, we start off in what's a general trainer. I flew T-34s, just a turboprop, fully aerobatic aircraft, airplane. Um, that's what we start in. And then once you get done with that, based on the needs of the Marine Corps, your grades and, and your preference, really, those three things determine whether you're going to go jets transport aircraft think uh c-130s right right or helicopters and any week it could be any order of of directions or it could be all helo heavy or all jet heavy just it's really based on what the marine corps needs um i was dumb enough that i got helicopters (laughs) so um and then and then based on that you go fly what's called a a th-57 it's a little bell Jet Ranger, like what you see uh, patrolling the highways for your uh, news and, right. and traffic. Um, fly that for a couple months, and, and you get your pre-required hours. And then you go through the same process again, just with Marine Corps aircraft. So you could go fly what I flew, which was CH-53s. Uh, it's a big transport helicopter. Um, the Battle Frog at the time, now it's Ospreys. Um, uh, uh, Hueys and Cobras. So you kind of have a, sl- you know, four aircraft selection. You can pick your aircraft. You can pick your desired coast. 
or duty station, or you can pick a combination of both. Um, so, I mean, that whole process took me from 2002 to when I got to the fleet or, you know, supporting Marines, which was in uh, the summer of 2005. So three years. Okay. So when you say supporting Marines, you were like just transportation or? Yeah. So the CH-53, what I flew for the majority of my career from about uh, 2005 to 2017, um, think of us as the school bus or the dump truck or want some heavy uh, use. Uh, sea stallion. Uh, that's right. Sea stallion. So we can carry up to 55 Marines. We typically carry... 35 to 37 this looks like the thing out of uh rambo like that Uh, it's it's got like that russian look to it i don't know i I can see where you yeah i can see where you're how recently did you see rambo nate (laughs) i don't know introduction that that was a russian that was a russian helicopter but yeah 1966 these things were uh introduced wow okay i see the uh i think it's the chinook flying over my house pretty often yeah so the Chinook is is kind of like our frog. It's a big brother to our frog. Our frog was called the CH forty six. The Chinook is called the CH forty seven. Okay. Um, again, same kind of utility aircraft. Um, it's got the dual prop. Dual prop, yeah, counter rotating props. Where ours has a single main rotor and then a tail rotor in the back. What's keep. the counter rotating for? Counter rotating, they both uh, rotate, obviously yeah, opposite different. directions, and it keeps it flying straight. Oh, okay. Whereas ours has one main head, mm-hmm. which rotates with such uh, force that we have to have a tail rotor pushing um, and that one the aircraft go, to counter. Makes it go side to side. It, it, exactly. It changes the the um, the heading. Okay, cool. We lost we lost a lot of electricians just now. <laughs> if we can reel them back in. Um, so, yeah, again, it, that, that process, you know, or I, I'm sorry, I flew that for – from 2005 to 2017 and we transport everything from marines sailors uh you know soldiers whoever needs to get from point a to point b we're transporting supplies mail uh red bull you know whatever's got to get to the front lines <laughs> right right <laughs> and uh and then we're bringing Gives it you back. wings <laughs> um we we actually had the capacity to carry um humvees okay slung underneath or or triple seven howitzers, wow. big guns, or anything you know that just couldn't fit inside. So that was our bread and butter. It was just heavy lift, um, getting things from point A to point B. Sure. So then after 2017, yeah. So after 2017, I was lucky enough to get selected and go through the rigorous process of of becoming a you know a, a marine helicopter pilot in what is called Marine One, the helicopter squadron that uh, flies Marine One. And uh, did that from 2017 to last week. Wow. How, how did the process work of going from, you know, transporting 37 Marines in a helicopter to transporting the commander in chief? Man, it's, it's kind of a loaded question, but it's, it's a humbling um, experience. I would not be more humble as a result. I no, feel like I'd be a lot less humble. So you were flying who? Oh, oh, Chris and Chad. Yeah, I, I was flying. <laughs> president, <laughs> such and such. So, you know, getting into the squadron, it's um, it's a unique experience. Where how, how many? Sorry to interrupt. How many people are in the squadron? So we currently have about seventy five pilots. Okay. So that's a pretty select group. Thirty, about thirty five of them fly what we consider white tops. So our white tops are the sixty, the Blackhawk that we fly, and the H three. Um, those are painted green and white, white tops. And then we also fly the Osprey, the MV-22 Osprey. Now, everybody outside that 35, that group of 35, stay and just fly the Osprey. Um, it's such a unique aircraft that they have to stick with that aircraft. Whereas the 35 of us that fly in the white tops, we are Huey pilots, Cobra pilots, Frog pilots, and CH-53 pilots. Is the Osprey, is that the one that has the rotating props Correct. that can yep. be an airplane or a Yep, or a exactly. Helicopter? Okay. And it's a unique um, it's a unique aircraft that the training is significantly different that they just say, hey, we're going to keep Osprey pilots flying Ospreys. Got it. Where the rest of us, we go through, we, we come out of the Fleet Marine Corps flying our fleet aircraft, the gray aircraft that we fly every day, 
supporting Marines. And then we go through a rigorous training process where we learn to fly these other two aircraft that we've never flown before, but we're flying them now in support of the president and the vice president. Yeah. So you, you go through a selection process and it's background checks, it's financial checks and going through your, your financial history. And then we are the only squadron in the Marine Corps that has the unique opportunities to select the people that are coming in. Usually the way the Marine Corps works is they tell you where you're going, right? You're going to go fly CH 53s in San Diego, California. You're going to go fly frogs in Okinawa and our squadron, the core of pilots that are there select who come in. And because you think about it, we spend so much time on the road, so much time in close contact with each other that they want this core of pilots to be close. They allow us to pick who comes in Mm. because they want it to be a good fit. This is a no fail mission. This is a mission that has to work and we have to get along and we have to um, deal with each other for four years. So the pilots select who comes in based on your reputation and how you were out in the fleet. So luckily either, you know, I didn't piss anybody off or the people I did piss off got out before they uh, (laughs) selected me. So, you know, it just reminds you that to treat people the way you want to be treated. And, uh, you you know, you look back at, at your career, whether it's helping instruct or, or flying with other guys in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you are. And, and you really have to evaluate, did I treat these people the way I wanted to be treated because there could be one guy there that's at the squadron saying, nope, that John guy, man, he was an asshole in right, Iraq. Right. I don't want him here. And and that there go your chances of getting in. Yeah. So that's, I mean, John, that's uh that's some good stuff there. I don't want to try to relate, you know, what you're doing to what we do in the trades, but in terms of like building a team, there's some similarities there. Um, we talk a lot about culture, about bringing good people to your organization, being a good person in your organization that other people are attracted to come work together because, sure. uh, you know, you're working with these guys day in and day out. I mean, you, you see them every day. You're dealing with potentially their callbacks or their mistakes or whatever. And so the bonding of people in the same industry on your team makes a ton of difference in terms of your own career uh, and your feelings about the future of your career on that team. And so were you ever part of the actual selection process where you were bringing others in? Yeah, absolutely. So after your first year, once you come into the squadron, you are now privy to all those people that are applying. Okay. Um, and, and it's, it's very simple. Once they, once they've kind of passed the background check and the financial check and they're, they're, you know, deemed clearable, you know, that, that portfolio or that folder of applicants sits in a room that we all have access to and you can thumb through that folder and see, Oh, Hey, this guy. Yep. He was a good guy. I had a great time with him. Definitely can get along or, you know, sometimes it's even, Hey, this guy was a good guy, but I just, he may not be the guy that I want to be spending three <laughs> nights, you know, right. in New York with, right. you know, for whatever, or, or you get the, you know, the quite, quite the other side of the spectrum. And it's like, man, this guy just, you know, doesn't handle stress very well, or he's just not friendly or every time we go out, he's got to put himself above everyone else. And that's not what this role is about. Um, so, so that stuff makes a difference. It right? does. It does. And we all, we all write notes and we write, Hey, I deployed with this guy and, and man, he just really was a team player and he really got it. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, when we come to the selection, we read those comments and the commanding officer reads those comments and he is the final say of who comes in and he, he agrees. And he says, yep, this guy's good for our, good for our unit. He's good for the the mission that we are, are doing. You know, it's, it's funny because we have similar conversations to that literally with <laughs> our, with our technicians, you know, if they know a guy and they start bringing him in, I mean, number one, they're pre-qualifying who they bring in. Yeah. Right? They're not intentionally going to bring in somebody that they don't want to work with, or that's going to be a detriment to their team. Yeah, absolutely. And then when they get somebody in here, we often do group interviews where we'll bring in multiple people like our service manager or maybe a team leader or something like that to sit in on the interview. And even if not there, we'll send them on a ride along to get another technician's perspective on who the guy is. You know, what was your read? Uh, you know, I don't know. He kind of seemed like he talked all about himself or, 
I don't know. It seemed like he, he knew what he was doing, you know, or this guy, he tried to cut in on me. Like while I was talking to the customer all the time, you know, we get that feedback. And so I, I like the, uh, I, I like the, what you're talking about there and the importance of what you do matters to the future. Like Absolutely. how you're conducting yourself now matters Absolutely. and it will come back to either find you in a good way or a bad way later on. Yeah, that's true. You know, and I was talking to Brian, um, maybe a couple of weeks ago and this true, this story, you know, rang true to he and I both in, in the discussion, but I was actually heading up to camp David, uh, on a Friday night. And my wife called me right after I landed up there. She said, Hey, it is burning hot in the house. I don't know something happened. It's not, it does not, it's not good. And I said, okay, well let's call, you know, a technician out. Let's, you know, see if we can get somebody out tomorrow on an emergency service call. I said, Hey, just shut everything down and, you know, and we'll wait till tomorrow. So sure enough, she, you know, shut, shut the HVAC system off. And the next day she said, yeah, it's still not working. I don't know what's going on. I said, yep, let's make the emergency call. And, um, you know, great response. And a guy came out and said, yeah, you know, old system, you know, I'm going to have to replace it. It's going to be 8,000 bucks, but you know, your military, I'll give it to you for seven. So she, gets the quote, she calls me up, she says, Hey, this is what uh you know, this is what it's gonna cost us. And and I I figured he's probably absolutely right. You know, we know we bought an old house a couple years prior. So we thought, yeah, we're gonna be putting in seven grand. Buddy of mine says, Hey, you know what? Just get a second recommendation. It's just always worth it. So I got back on Monday, called the same company, and I said, Hey, we had somebody come out on Saturday. Can you just send somebody else? I'll stick with your company. That's fine. But just send somebody else out. And uh, they sent out a guy named Robert. And I'll tell you what, his performance, his his character, when he came out, he, he took me downstairs. He told me exactly what was wrong. He's like, listen, you don't need a new system. You don't even need need new components. This is just what you need to do, and let's service it. And you know, he didn't he didn't bash the guy that came ahead of him. He just said, "Hey, he he's a new guy. He's not used to working with older equipment. I've seen this equipment. I've I seen I've seen what you're you know running. It's just maybe it's just a lack of experience. Um, and I'll tell you what he he." <laughs> Ironically, he was f- former Marine as well. Okay. Um, but man, it, it changed my outlook on the type of people that I want coming out to the house. And I'll tell you, every single time I've needed service, which has been uh, probably five or six times since then, I call Robert directly or I'll call the company and say, hey, give me Robert. I only want Robert coming out because he took the time. He came out. He introduced himself. He told me his background. He showed me what he's doing. He explained what to do if it happens again. He talked to my boys. He talked to my wife. He treated her with respect. I mean, I'm responsible for who comes in and out of my house. I want somebody like that in my house. And I'm okay if I'm not there, him coming in without me or just with my kids and my wife there. I will allow that because I've seen his character. You know, and so that's, I think, you know, that's what you're explaining, you know, that's what we're looking for. And that's what I want out of all my, you know, all the people that come to my house. And as a, as a homeowner, who's not involved in the trades whatsoever, except on the receiving in how, how, how beneficial and, and stress relieving and relaxing is it to know that that quality of, of a human being is, is going to be coming to service the, you know, the heat pump when you're, when you're across the country, when you're in Denver or it what is, have you. It is huge. Absolutely huge. And it's such a relief because you know that when you see a bill come across, you know, your inbox for whatever amount, it's, it's justifiable. I am, I'm willing to pay that without second guessing. Was, was he just trying to get a couple, you know, dollars out of me for service things that weren't related or was he overestimating what you know what have you and 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 then to you know to his uh praise 
I now put his cards all over our downstairs, um, you know, our, our uh, utility closet so that the next people that are that have just bought our house and move in, they're going to be calling him as well. And I'm referring him out to other people. I'm referring him to the other pilots in my squadron. Hey, if you need a quality dude, hey, he's a Marine. He gets us. He gets that we're going to be gone, but he is going to also provide you with phenomenal service. And if he doesn't, I will vouch for him, and, and that's on me. That's awesome. Is he looking to move to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area <laughs> by chance? Because, one, we could use another Marine. Two, uh, we, need, we need more of this quality of, of service professional yeah. that, that understands that acting out of empathy means anything he recommends is probably going to be done. Yeah. Um, because he acts self selflessly. Yeah. And this is the way to build the team, to build his, his company. He's not the owner of the company, right? Yeah. No. He's a service tech. Yep. And, and, you know, I've been fortunate enough with a lot of the, the people that come out, uh, a plumber, um, a bug sprayer, HVAC guy, I, you know, I, I get them and man, if they provide a quality service, if they provide just decent, if they're just decent people to my family, you know, and engage my boys who are all boys and want to know like, Hey, what's that thing hanging off your belt? Or, <laughs> you know, what's in the back of your truck? And they say, Oh, yeah, come on out and check it out, man. I'm calling that guy every single time directly. And I'm not, I'm not deviating. I mean, that's, you've got a customer for life. So Brian, you had mentioned um, that he, that that service professional was acting humbly. And I want to kind of segue into that, John, so is it true that uh, when the president flies, three helicopters are flying at the same time? That is not always true. Okay. So um, we, we, we like to have backups to backups, right? All right. Um, is it true that the side wing helicopters are, are going to take a bullet if something's coming? <laughs> <laughs> Partially true. Or have I watched yeah. too many movies? You, you've seen some <laughs> movies, yeah. Um, you, Hollywood. Are you hearkening back to a Harrison Ford movie by chance? Or maybe uh, Gerald Steven Butler. Cigar. I was thinking yeah. uh, London, yeah. da- London Down. Yeah. 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 You know, I showed my wife that movie, and she's like, I don't know if it was a good thing that you showed me this or a bad thing. <laughs> um, you know, we, we like to always plan for the worst. Uh, you know, and it's this service has taught me a lot of things. You you plan for, you know, the worst case scenario, you brief to the best case scenario, but you plan for the worst Right. and somewhere in between is usually what's going to happen, but you're prepared for it. You know, a lot of my friends, you know, I've, I've talked to them about being a pilot and they think every single day I go out, like I'm flying American airlines and I just jump in and I fly to point A to point B to point C and then I'm done. Um, we in the military, and I think this is pilots across the board in the military, we plan significantly for every flight. It's, it's eight hours of planning for one hour of flight, you know, and, and yeah, some of it may be overkill and some of it is um, redundant, but at the end of the day, if the worst case scenario happens, we're usually pretty prepared for it. Um, One of my mentors told me, that every time you go out and fly is like a little marble. You put all your flight hours into an into a aquarium. I've got 3,500 hours, so that's 3,500 marbles in this aquarium, right? Every day is, that's a good day, or every day that the flight goes well, it's a white marble. And every day that there's an emergency is a black marble. So let's fill up your tank, 3,500 white marbles. And let's put one black marble in there. And every time you go fly, you reach in and you pull out a marble. Every time you fly again, you reach in and put up, pull out a marble. You're probably going to pull out a white marble. But that one day you pull out a black marble, you better be ready right. for the worst case scenario. And so that's how we train. We go through simulators and we train to the worst case scenarios and compounding scenarios and, you know, things that we'll probably never see in our lifetime and nobody ever would, would want to see, but we trained to that. And, and so that's, that's how we prepare. I I don't remember, I don't remember what your original question was, but I'll get back to that, but I want to touch on what you just said there. So eight hours of planning for one hour of flight time. Yeah. 
I mean, we, we drastically encourage our technicians to follow that same pattern, right? Somebody used the analogy, uh, what was it, Brian, about um, playing and practicing. You know, you spend eight hours we're, to... We're the one trade that spends right. 30 minutes training in the morning for eight hours of, right. of gameplay um, in, in the morning and afternoon. Right. I mean, imagine flipping that on its head, right? One hour of planning for eight hours of flying. I mean, yeah. you wouldn't even be able to consider all the possibilities that are going to happen in that time. Yeah. And yet our technicians hop in the truck and they go out and have an eight hour day after maybe having a half hour. Maybe. 40, Ho- hopefully maybe, they're, they're right? at a place that has a half hour meeting in the morning. Otherwise it's just straight from whatever was going on in their living room. Right. Uh, hopefully something positive, but could be something negative. And then they're just running right into the, to the client's house. Yeah. And, and so the, the idea of planning for the best, but, or, or, or you know, planning, you said prepping for the best, but also con- considering the worst, I think there's so many good similarities there to what our technicians, plumbers, and electricians do in the field, as far as like preparing themselves for what's going to happen in the home, the flight time, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I guess, if I were to think about it from your guys' shoes, you know, some of the customers you, you guys deal with are probably like the worst case scenario flights that we, we have, you know, from a, a compounds, you know, issue that's going on with the equipment followed by a, you know, lousy customer followed by probably a situation that's, you know, not uh, very fun to work in or a work environment. That's not great. You know, those are, those are compounding issues that can create a significant amount of stress. I assume, you know, (laughs) absolutely. Absolutely. And and so I wouldn't want to walk into that. It's like a a battlefield of its own walking into every day. You don't know where you're going to walk, you know, what scenario you're going to walk into. So when it's not just, it's not just the homeowner either. It's your own personal feelings, right? So you've flown for three presidents, two Two presidents, Trump and and Biden. Okay. So obviously one Republican, one Democrat, I'm not asking who you are. Okay, it doesn't matter uh, because no matter who you are, you were flying for somebody that you probably disagreed with. Right. Maybe you disagree with both of them. You probably right. did. And, and we're we're just walking up a driveway, and we actually had this conversation uh, before before the podcast. Um, John and I did on the phone a few yeah. weeks ago, where I'm just like, you know, we w- we would have to walk up a driveway, and whichever side you lean on, the inevitably there's a poster hammered in the lawn two feet away from you. That's sure. the, the opposing political party of your choosing and you're walking past it and then have to, you know, swallow your pride and your opinion and, and you, and serve this, this homeowner. And this is your job to show up and serve it. And that can be hard depending on what you, what kind of sign you're walking past. Sure. You're sitting, (laughs) as you told me that the, the cockpit of these, these, uh, I'm sorry, the whole, the whole inside of the, the whole cabin of the helicopter is about the size of this table we're sitting yeah. at right now. You're three feet away from, you know, either the president on your side or, or on the opposing side or how, however you would want to put it. Um, and and I, I'm fascinated. I think I stopped you short of actually talking about that because I'm like, let's talk about it on the air, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to hear, like, how do you, I mean, we have a hard enough time as it is just stepping over that sign or it, it might not be a political party, but something, some ideal that it can be very opposed to, to my own beliefs. And, you know, we have a hard enough time just with a sign like that. How do you, how did you? Yeah, do you um, do you create a little bit of turbulence in the air? Like, Nate, I didn't really like Nate that vote did, last night. Nate didn't know that this isn't a video co- uh, <laughs> a video podcast, but he did the uh, air, air quotes, quotes yeah. with his finger. He's a pilot; he gets it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. He can see you, buddy. <laughs> it's all it's all about the hands, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the everyone listening that has no idea you did that. Yeah. <laughs> so all how, how, five how, of them. How did you overcome that, or how do you overcome? that? Well, you know the the easy answer is as a military member. We're supposed to be apolitical. A higher ideal. We don't sign up serving a president. Right. You know, a lot of people, when when Trump first took office, how could you fly for President Trump? I can't believe you. I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter. I Yeah, I came in um, during the first year of his presidency, and I left my last year in the squadron was going into the second year of, of Biden's presidency. You know, we serve the roles that we serve because that's our job we don't serve a particular president we don't serve a particular ideal we serve americans 
We serve our country. That is what we are called to do, whether you're in any service or any, any role. And so that just is magnified when you get into this, into this squadron, it doesn't matter. And, and, you know, another, uh, unique thing about picking the pilots that come in is, is they know they're hand selected and they're hand selected to represent the squadron. And that squad squadron represents the president. We've got his seal on the side of the aircraft. And when we're flying him, we work for him or her regardless. And so you do see a couple incidences here and there about people speaking out, but it gets squashed pretty quickly because we know that as unique as our mission is, we're still just regular Marines. You know, we're just serving a role. Uh, we are the help. And so um, I think when it, when you put it into perspective like that, that, that this is going to, that this job is going to continue regardless of who's sitting there, regardless of what the beliefs, you just kind of realize, yeah, I'm, I'm here for a bigger purpose than to complain about whether I believe this president's the right one or not. So that's a very humble attitude, and that's kind of uh, circling back to what I had originally asked you. So uh, I imagine there's a certain level of sacrifice you have to prepare to make, whether it's literally giving your life or spending a significant amount of time away from your family. Uh, humility, sacrifice, they're all built into the cake when it comes to accepting the role. Uh, humility is certainly an attribute that we look for in technicians. Um, it, it takes a certain level of humility to be a servant, to actually go into somebody's home and try to help them out in a time of need, often a time of great stress. Um, and along with that empathy that comes along with being able to understand the position that they are in, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of anything. Or could, even or even better, their treatment of you. Sure, yeah. And, you know, we get homeowners who are, they think they're, you know, master licensed plumbers and electricians and certified I can only imagine. HVAC techs and yep. <clears throat> probably like you once or twice in that cockpit looking in the rear view mirror <laughs> going, I know I could do a better job at this president <laughs> thing than you. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we, yeah, you have to deal with it, swallow your pride, swallow your ego and realize you're there to serve. Um, but I just, I just feel like that's got to be on a, just a massive scale on, on what you were doing in that well, pilot seat. The humility thing is easy. I think for Marines, especially because we already know we're Marines, you know, the jokes, you know, we eat crayons and we lick windows and <laughs> you know, we may be dumb, but we can lift heavy objects, all that stuff like that. That kind of puts us in our place already. <laughs> we'll let the air force have the cool call signs and, you know, and, the Navy can do their cool things and, but, but Marines were really good at doing more with less. Okay. And so humility I think is, is really in the heart of, of a lot of Marines. I mean, it's, it's, you meet a Marine on the street that he's probably going to say, Oh man, I don't know anything. I'm just a dumb grunt. I'm, you know, whatever. That's, that's our Marine culture. And that's, I don't want to speak for all Marines, but I mean, a lot of people that I'm around are, are incredibly humble people and they've done some amazing amazing things and so it's easy um you know when you it, when you get to this position because it is truly another role you know my wife asked is it harder to fly for the president or is it harder to fly for you know a bunch of marines you know in afghanistan or i said you know what to be honest it's hard flying for both but you know flying 24 Marines in the back of the aircraft, man, that's 24 families that you're affecting. Right. Yeah. That's 24 dads and husbands. And you know, it, it's sons, it's sobering to think, you know, one about the lives that are lost, but about how many, how much you can affect by not being on your a game that day. And so we have to remain humble, especially as, as aviators, um, because things can go south real quick. And if you're not humble, if you're not ready and, and not prepared, y you can find yourself in a real bad day and, and, and people get hurt very easily. So if you're willing to talk about it, let's, let's talk about a bad day because at a very, everybody in the home services industry has experienced a bad day, whether it's being in a vehicle accident, you know, and the rest of your day got shot, uh, not, you know, and you, you missed all your calls or, whether you got placed on a callback that was just completely disastrous, whether somebody in the home reamed you out, 
from top to bottom. Oh, um, and, and, and far worse. And Gas far. leaks, carbon monoxide sure. leaks, electrocution. Um, yeah. So there's there's Fire. plenty of plenty of bad days. I'm, again, not trying to relate yeah. your bad day versus, but just the general concept of what you do when something goes wrong. So first there's the mentality of how do you overcome when something goes wrong? And then there's the kind of the long-term effects of how do you move on from it? So in your training and in all your career, I mean, what was some examples of some bad days? How did you overcome them in the moment? And then how did you also like move past it and, and put it in the past? Well, I mean, from a personal perspective, I, a bad day is losing an engine in flight. Right. Um, you know, it's uh, when you're flying, you know, your engines are providing uh, torque and, and helping the main rotor spin and keeping you in the air. You know, you lose one of them, you know, you've got one more, but you lose some significant capabilities. And, you know, that's happened twice. And I've had, you know, smaller issues in flight, but, you know, recognizing first that something's going on that's different and just taking a second to just breathe, right? Taking a second to just take it in, take a deep breath, realizing where you're at, realizing this is not how things are supposed to go, but not just blindly reacting because something's happening. You really got to put forth that mental effort to pause, evaluate, and then respond. So that right there, I mean, that, that concept, even those, those three words, Paul's evaluate, respond, is that like trained into you? Is that, is that natural? It, it's not, it's definitely not natural because we get into the simulator all the time and, and scenarios and emergencies are thrown at us at rapid rate. And the first thing you want to do is you want to start responding. You want to start, you know, um, turning engines off or shutting off fuel or, you know, addressing the issue and sometimes if you do that you will respond incorrectly and you'll just exacerbate the problem altogether and make your problem so much bigger so if you can quickly analyze and evaluate and do so correctly your day is going to be a lot better off you know and, and we talk about compound emergencies compound emergency is one emergency that leads to another so a fire or, or sorry, a uh, engine failure that leads to something spinning and, and catching on fire, and then that fire burning through your tail rotor, and now your tail rotor is ineffective. And, you know, you go through the line, and you take a perfectly good aircraft one second, and then 30 seconds later it's on in fly, you know, it's not flyable anymore. That's a compound emergency. But if you can take the second to, to stop and correctly analyze, you could probably save yourself the other 29 seconds of action that may or may not even help you out. So how, um, how do you begin to counteract what is the natural reaction and, and actually insert that pause? Because that's, di that's a difficult piece. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's where the training comes in. That's where getting in the simulator every day or, you know, every opportunity and actually going through these scenarios and knowing yourself better than, you know, you did the day before and thinking, okay, when I was in the simulator, I experienced the same issue and I made the wrong analysis and it resulted in X, Y, Z. I'm going to stop. I'm going to look. I mean, really there's, there's one or two scenarios that you really have to react fast in, in an aircraft. And that's if your main rotor stops spinning or starts to slow down, you, the first thing you got to do is you, you reduce your collective or you reduce the pitch of the blades. That's the, that's really like one of the only things that you have to do naturally and, and very quickly have to analyze. But everything else most likely just takes a few seconds of, of recognizing what's going on or trying to analyze that correctly. Um, and then it's just, it just comes with time. You know, flying towards the end of my career, flying for the squadron, flying for the president, they take pilots that, that haven't necessarily flown this aircraft, but they've got experience in other aircraft. And, and the helicopter, you know, is similar. The, the, the helicopters that we fly out in the fleet are similar. So they're not taking guys that, hey, we don't really care that you haven't flown these specific aircraft, but you've got experience flying in general. And so they know that that, that experience is kind of built into your time um, before you come into the squadron. 
So Brian, I, I vote that we stop calling it role play and start and start calling it. Like, we're going to put you in the simulator. Yeah, flight simulator. Out. Yeah, right, I, I like that. It's it's good. I like it. It's so good. And you said you would do that uh, dunker course for yeah. every four years, which yeah. sounds like probably the most intense flight simulation. It's um, it's not fun. I mean, you're sitting in a in a the dunker, right? This can, and you're there's two pilot seats. Or, pilot co-pilot seats up front and then the back is lined with some chairs as well and they put you in there and slowly dunks underwater and then it flips upside down and you're upside down strapped into this thing and you've got to find your way out but that's the end result the first day it's hey let's get in the water let's you know crawl walk run let's or or let's get in the water let's get used to the water let's sit on the side of the of the pool with your feet up on the side and let's dunk you upside down and let you feel just that water rushing into your nasal, you know, your sure. nasal cavities. And then we'll bring you back right back up. And then the second time we do it, now we're going to strap you into just a chair that rotates upside down and you just unbuckle. And then after that, we're going to put you in that same chair, flip you upside down, unbuckle. Now you got to swim through a little obstacle course. So it's gradually working you up to expand your comfort, you know, comfortability. And then at the end of the day, now you're in this dunker with a bunch of your buddies and whether you are assigned to go out the window first or you're assigned to go out the window last, you're pretty comfortable. So it's crawl, crawl, walk, run mentality. Get used to it. Get warmed up. Get confident in yourself. And then at the end of the day, we'll, we'll test you to your full capability. All for the purpose of what? All for the purpose of when you're in the aircraft and you're flying over water, the worst case scenario happens and you've got to make an emergency landing in the water. Helicopters are top heavy, so they're initially going to roll upside down and they're going to start sinking. So that if this worst case scenario happens, you have the confidence in yourself to do the procedures that you need to do to survive. Is there a version of that? where at some point when you join the squadron are you are you training to get the commander in chief out of that chair as well or is there someone else that takes care of that in, uh, with the secret service in the back or no we we try to minimize how much we're flying over water with with potus oh really yeah just uh, uh you know in the fleet we're you know i think we're flying over terrain that we can't necessarily dictate our flight path we're trying to just stay out of harm's way. Sometimes that's over water. Sometimes that's not. Um, sometimes that's shipped to shore. You know, as Marines, we work directly with the Navy. We're coming off Naval vessels, usually 40, 50 miles, a hundred miles off, um, offshore. So as Marine pilots, it's in our, it's in our roots. It's in our heritage to come from ship to shore. So that's, you know, specifically why we do it. That's not specific to the, to the flying the POTUS, you know, and, in you know, to be quite honest, when we're, when we're flying in, we're trying to stay out away from the water too, just because it's, it's not fun. It's not, we're not prepared for it. So the, you have to do that dunker piece every four years. Yeah. Right. So I, I would imagine like right around year three, you start kind of getting that anxiety. Oh man, it is the worst. <laughs> it, you, the best time that you feel good about this dunker crap is the day after it's done <laughs> and then every day after that it's like you're counting down uh, to the next time yeah right <laughs> and i was even i was convinced i did the dunker in uh last in 2020 i went to my last dunker event right because it just lined up just right to where i had to do it one more time and i thought you know what i haven't died yet <laughs> but this time is probably gonna be the time that i'm gonna die i'm gonna i'm gonna have to be pulled from that dunker and resuscitated so <laughs> I made sure my will was up to date and everything. I said goodbye to my kids before I went, <laughs> just in case. Now I'm picturing just like a three-foot pool, you know? <laughs> a little kitty outdoor yeah. pool. <laughs> I'm sure that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. I'll take you out there sometime. <laughs> oh, my word. You couldn't even put me upside down, much now, less some, in water. <laughs> there's some good videos. If you, if you want to YouTube, you know, Marine Corps Hilo Dunker or Navy Hilo Dunker. And you can see these guys, you know, there's probably some guys out there floundering and, and just 
uh, trying to survive, but, but it's, it's, it's great training. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of the training we receive in the Marine Corps is redundant and, and, you know, you kind of shake your head and you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I going through tobacco, you know, cessation classes when I don't even smoke or I don't dip and why do they make me learn this stuff? Um, but there's the Hilo dunker and then, you know, survival school. We'll post some Hilo dunker videos on the Waste No Day <laughs> Facebook group uh, when the episode releases. Yeah. But uh, those those are some good train. Those are the best training that you receive. Are there any YouTube videos of you in the dunker? No. No, I had those deleted. <laughs> I contacted YouTube directly. <laughs> he, he knows especially the POTUS before after this, all. Yeah. Especially before this podcast. Make sure those are taken Excuse down. me, President. That was an executive videos order. Delete. The ones where I was crying upside yeah. down. <laughs> when you cry upside down, the tears actually go... <laughs> You know, back into your nose, and you could drown from that. So. Wow, I did not know that. I, out of all the ways that I thought I could die, that hadn't crossed my mind yet. I was going to try to give Nate a swirly after this and see what happened, but I'm glad you cleared that up for us. Well, John and Brian, I thank you so much for everything that you've been sharing today. This is such rich content that I think we could keep going. And instead of making this like a long, drawn-out episode, I think what we're going to do is take this into two parts. We're going to pause the episode now and you're just going to have to stay tuned for the rest of this content next week as we follow up with Lieutenant Colonel John Ballinger on what else he has to offer for the trades. So stay tuned next week. We hope that this episode and what you've already heard today has been excellent content and that it's been challenging you. Swirl it around in your head, listen to it again, and prepare yourself for what else he's going to bring next week because I guarantee it's going to be even better stuff. Uh, so much of what he talked about today is applicable to what we do in the trades. And that's what we were talking about at the top of the show with the, the parallels and the analogies that go back and forth between what he was doing as a Marine Corps uh, pilot aviator and, and what we do in the trades. Not that we're flying helicopters, but the disciplines, the, the, uh, the humility, the teamwork, all those things play into each other um, on both sides of that equation. And I think there's a lot of things to draw out there. We hope that this has been effective and challenging for you. And we want to make sure that uh, we continue to bring content like this for you. So drop us a line in the comment section. Hit us up with a five-star review. We'd love to hear from you about more things or ideas that you'd like to hear of uh, and for us to explore on the show. And, of course, we'd always just like to know how you're doing out there. Thanks for doing what you are doing in the trades. We know it's hot. We know it is a busy season. And so hang in there. More great content to come. And thanks for being some of those uh, humble servants who are taking care of the clients today. As always, our challenge we leave with you at the end of the show is to choose to wake up every single morning and waste no day. Mm -hmm.